problem with this approach, which is basically an approach of historicist nominalism, because the underlying logic is that infamous uh, pseudo-deconstructionist logic of there is no modernity as such. There are only particular modernities, like uh, uh, West European, African, Latin America, and so on and so on. Of course, this is true. The problem is elsewhere. The problem is that through this nominalist reduction, again, by claiming that only particular modernities effectively exist, the site of antagonism is reduced to only one particular modernity. It is no longer modernity as such, which is characterized by antagonism imbalance. Imbalance is dismissed as just pertaining to a certain species of particular species of modernity. And what is problematic with this? Well, to put it very simply, did we not have already in the early 20th century, in the first part of the 20th century, one big well-known project of alternate modernity? It was called fascism. Fascism was precisely the first big attempt to build an alternate modernity. That is to say, to have the process of modernization, industrial development, and so on, but without paying the price of alienation, social disintegration, and so on and so on. What should we then oppose to this model? We should oppose to it the idea that some antagonism, we can call it by different names, Marxists would have called it, traditional Marxists would have called it class struggle, Frankfurt School would have called it uh, dialectic of enlightenment, but the idea being that there is some antagonistic potential in the very project of capitalist modernity. That is to say that all these phenomena that we deplore, wars, violences, concentration camps, new fundamentalism, you name it, that all this is not simply a regression, or as Habermas would have put it, a sign of modernity as an unfinished project, but is part of the very project of modernity. This is what gets lost. Which is why I think that although it wants to be historicist, critical, this idea of reducing the antagonistic aspects of modernity to just one particular form of modernity is deeply ideological, because it saves unblemished the general notion of modernization. What we should insist on is, on the contrary, as I've just said, that there is an antagonism inherent to the very universal notion of modernity, and now coming to my point, so that the particular species of modernity are not just examples or exemplifications of their universal genius, of their universal notion, but they are, in a way, reactions to it. They fight it. Modernity, as a universal notion, names a certain deadlock, a certain antagonism, and particular really existing forms of modernity are attempts to resolve this deadlock, to solve the problem. Liberal capitalism, as one form of modernity, wants to solve the deadlock of modernity in a certain way through market freedoms and so on. Fascist modernization in a different way. Latin American modernization in a different way. So what's properly dialectical here? It's again this very reversal of the usual constellation. It's not that struggle is at the level of the particular content, while universal is just some kind of neutral, empty container. So that universal means some encompassing global notion, and then within this notion particular forms struggle, like fascist modernization against liberal modernization, and so on and so on. No, the site of the struggle is universal antagonism itself, and all particular actually existing modernisms are attempts to cover up, resolve this problem. So, again, we should remember this, that the site of antagonism is universality. What has have this to do with virtual as real? Ah, precisely this site of universality as the site of antagonism is virtual. In what sense? In the sense that 
there is no universal modernization. It's just a certain virtual constellation of a certain antagonism. All that exists, nominalists are here right, all that effectively exists are just particular forms of modernization. There is no modernis modernity as such. There only is Anglo-Saxon, uh, Latin American, African, and so on, fascist modernity. But in order to grasp the very dynamic of these particular forms, one has to refer them to this, their absent cause, to the big antagonism to which they react. So, again, this would have been another example of how the notion of virtual as real is operative, of how it is a necessary notion if we are to grasp the concrete social dynamic, especially of today's global capitalism. So the conclusion to be drawn from all this is that the category of the real is ultimately a purely formal category. It's not a category of some formless content disturbing order. It's a pure structural gap. It's a, an entirely non-substantial category. It's, if we may put it in these terms, it's a difference, but a pure difference. A pure difference in the sense that it's a difference which is paradoxically prior to what it is the difference between. So it's not that we have two terms and there is a difference between the two terms. Paradoxically, the two positive terms appear afterwards as attempts to to dominate, cover up the tension and so on of this difference. Again, how can this be? Another simple example, just to illustrate this logic, the, the political distinction, I know it's half forgotten today, nobody wants to hear about it, but nonetheless, the distinction between left and right. The first thing that strikes the eye about this distinction, if you take it seriously, is that it's not just a distinction within a certain social code. It's not that in a certain society, if you take into account all political forces, we can say these are right-wing forces, these are left-wing forces, and then all the intermediate phenomena in between center, center-left, center-right, whatever you want. It's different. It is that if you ask a right-winger how is the entire social field structured, you will get a totally different answer than if you ask a left-winger, or for that matter, if you ask a centrist. To simplify it, a right-winger will tell you that society is an organic, harmonious unity, at least the traditional right-winger, and that left radicals are external intruders. What is anathema for a radical Conservative is the idea that there is an antagonism, an imbalance inscribed into the very heart of the social edifice. For a left-winger, the struggle is admitted as central. So again, the point is that there is no neutral way to define the difference between left and right. In itself, it's a void. It's just that you can approach it either from the leftist or from the rightist point of view. And incidentally for Lacan, it's exactly in the same way that also uh, sexual difference functions. Sexual difference is not a difference between the two species of humanity in general, but it's the within, from the male perspective, sexual difference itself appears in a different way than from the feminine perspective. So again, difference paradoxically comes first. Crucial philosophically is this, let's call it, pure formalism. And against the reproach that we are dealing here with some kind of idealism, isn't matter in its positive inert presence primordial. I think that we should reject this reproach and precisely insist on this notion of, how should I call it, purely formal materialism. Materialism is materialism of the difference. The minimal feature of materialism being 
that there is a pure difference, that there is a crack, an antagonism in, within the order of the one, that the primordial fact is pure self-difference. I'm very precise here. Self-difference and not any kind of these mythological polar opposites, feminine, masculine, light, darkness, yin, yang, and so on. I think that here radical materialism should be even critical towards Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze, who likes to assert some kind of primordial multitude as the ultimate ontological fact. From the radical